Thank you, Skyler. Good morning and welcome on this beautiful Sunday morning to Geist Christian Church. My name is Ryan Hazen. I'm the lead pastor of this campus. Uh, we do have two campuses. If you are new to us, you are at our Mud Creek campus. You probably knew that part. We also have a campus at 126th and Promise Road in Fishers. I would uh, ask that you record attendance and any prayer concerns. If you're in this place, you can use a physical card or right at the bottom of the bulletin on the back side is a QR code that will take you to a virtual card. Online, there's a QR code, or you can go to our website and record your attendance uh, even after worship. If you're worshiping online, welcome uh, to worship. You should have gathered something to represent the elements. If you're in this place, that's a, a communion kit on your way in. Uh, if you're new to these communion kits, the bottom part is the wafer, and I suggest you open that first before you open the juice and then try to get to the wafer, okay? If you're online, I hope that you've gathered something to represent the elements. Samantha Copeland, our Minister of Youth and Young Adults, will gather us around the table later in the service. There are a number of announcements in the bulletin, uh, new announcements as we look forward to May, uh, save the date kind of things, but we are uh, making uh, a push to help address food insecurity in, in our community and see how Geist Christian Church can be involved in that, so I hope that you will give attention to that. There are a couple of things uh, let me uh, point your attention to. After worship in the Great Hall, there is an opportunity for you to get information about uh, how you can uh, connect with members of Congress as they, uh, it's a bipartisan farm bill that is before them but uh, needs to be passed and that affects our community. So give attention to that. Also, on May the 6th, it's the second announcement on the back of the bulletin. There'll be a rice and bean uh, supper that night, and there will be uh, folks from our food pantries here to discuss that are sort of on the front line. So I hope that you will give attention to that. If this is your first service of worship with us, welcome to you. If you'd like some more information about our mission and ministry, I hope that you'll, if you're in this place, make your way after worship to our Welcome Center. Uh, if you're online, connect with me either email or phone, and I'd be happy to, uh, to share with you about our congregation. Now, as we continue in worship, uh, let us stand and sing our opening hymn. It is not in the hymnal, so it's just on the screens, the day of resurrection. Let's stand and sing.
Good morning. morning. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for the opportunity to gather today as we turn our hearts and minds to you in worship. We're grateful for your steadfast presence in our lives, your unfailing grace and love for each one of us. We ask that you open our minds to your word today, that we draw nearer to you. Lord, may the Holy Spirit dwell within us so that we may be your witnesses, your hands and feet in the world spreading the good news of the risen Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. may be seated. Today's scripture lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36 through 49. That's page 91 of your pew Bibles in the New Testament. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and feet, see that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. While while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning with Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and see I am sending upon you what my father promised, So stay here in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high.
Thank you, choir. In our community, we offer prayers of healing this day for uh, Rob Giles, Rob Hyde, Livia Douglas, Larry Becker, London Gustin, Jeff Delosier, Sally Hughes, who's here, upcoming surgeries, McKenna Bird and Bonnie Altimus. Let us go to God in prayer. Life-giving God, the light of your love shines, illuminating the places where you are present. As the bewildered disciples pondered the stories of Christ's appearance, you penetrated their fear and doubt with your word of peace. He showed them your hands and feet. Jesus opened their minds. Increase our understanding, we pray. Open our minds and hearts to receive you. Bring to us, O God, the sense of your living presence as we go into this new week. Renew in us the faith you want us to have, a faith that is not afraid to reach out in your name to share the treasure you have given to us. Help us to be witnesses. God, you know our hearts, you know our needs, you know the hearts of those around us. We lift ourselves and them before you. Hear our prayers for our world, for those who serve on our behalf, for leaders of our city, state, nation, and world. In our own congregation, you know the heart of each one gathered, but by name we Pray for healing this day for Sally and Rob and Jeff, London, Larry, Livia, Rob. God, surround McKenna and Bonnie this week as their medical teams surround them. We pray for wisdom and insight. Walk with us, O oh God. Empower us to tell our story of how you have changed our lives. This we pray in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. And that's the way it is. April 14th, 2024. If Walter Cronkite were preaching today, he might end his sermon that way, just as he ended his news broadcast as anchor for the CBS evening news from 1962 to 1981. What I never knew, or perhaps once knew and had forgotten, which seems to be much more common these days, is that Walter Cronkite did not sign off every news broadcast that way. Keeping to strict standards of objective journalism, he omitted the phrase, and that's the way it is, on the nights that he ended the broadcast with an opinion piece or his commentary. In no way did he want his opinion or a commentary to be misconstrued as fact. Cronkite, early in his career, changed the way that news was reported. He became one of the first to report the news from the site of the news rather than from a studio. In the 60s and 70s, he was voted the most trusted man in America for his unbiased reporting of important news such as the Vietnam War, the assassination of John Kennedy, and the Watergate scandal. When the time came for Cronkite to retire in 1981, another up-and-coming eyewitness news reporter, Dan Rather, was tapped to fill Cronkite's shoes. Both Cronkite and Rather reported the news like they were witnesses to the event. Their reporting style gave credibility to the story they were telling. It was a part of what made CBS number one in evening news among the three networks for many years in a row. Yes, children, in the old days there were just three networks. And here's the really wild part. 
You had to actually get up to change between them. (laughs) The eyewitness nature of the news did the unthinkable when it increased the evening news program from 15 minutes to 30 minutes. Even today, one local television station has branded its news program as eyewitness news to give credibility to that which it reports. Just this week, NBC Nightly News had Lester Holt reporting on the solar eclipse live from the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Eyewitness on the scene reporting provides accountability to that which is being reported. Today's scripture, like last week's with Thomas, has to do with those who witnessed Jesus after his resurrection, but before his ascension into heaven. We have much to learn from these early eyewitnesses. While the resurrection was wonderful, Jesus' message for them and for us is it's not a place to get stuck. As we'll see, Jesus needs to prod his disciples a little bit. It's not enough to proclaim Christ is risen and be done with it. At some point, the disciples are going to have to get out there to move from the event of the resurrection to sharing what it means in their life. Where we picked up this morning with Kyle's reading, Cleopas and his companion are telling the other disciples how Jesus appeared to them on the road to Emmaus. Just then, Jesus once again shows up out of nowhere, interrupting their conversation. Peace be with you, he says. They see him, they hear his voice, but they do not recognize him. It says that they thought that they were seeing a ghost. They know Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried. They had heard reports from the women, but they had called it an idle tale, which sometimes gets translated as garbage. They knew dead men don't come back from to life. This can only be a ghost, a spirit without a body. The tomb is open, but their minds are closed. They are continuing to live, think, and understand in the usual human categories. They have separated divinity and humanity, heaven and earth. Like them, whenever we make that separation, we close our minds. We deny ourselves the resurrected life for which Christ died, and we lose our ability to recognize holiness in one another and in ourselves. With Jesus' resurrection, God shatters these human categories of who God is, where God's life and energy can be found, and how God works in the world. Resurrected life can never be comprehended, contained, or controlled by human thought or understanding. Jesus' resurrection compels us to step outside our usual human understandings of reality and enter into this divine reality. For the disciples, that new reality begins with touching and seeing, flesh and bones, hands and feet, and even giving Jesus a broiled piece of fish to eat. Jesus said to his disciples, look at my hands and my feet, see that it is I myself, touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Then he showed them his hands and his feet, After this he ate that piece of broiled fish in their presence, even eating A piece of fish is significant because it's done to show them that he's not a ghost. Ghosts don't need to eat. Flesh and bones, hands and feet, broiled fish are things of creation, the natural order. Jesus is real. For the longest time, Jesus told his disciples to keep quiet about his identity On numerous occasions, upon witnessing a miracle, Jesus asked his witnesses to tell no one. Scholars call that a messianic secret. 
Largely, that was because they didn't yet understand what would happen. But in these post-resurrection stories, like our Scripture today, Jesus has changed His tune. He is now deputizing those around Him as witnesses. Verse 48 of our reading is about as direct as it gets. You are witnesses of these things. Notice that Jesus does not say to the disciples, would you please be witnesses? He also doesn't say, would you consider being a witness if you have a little extra time on your hands? As it turns out, witnessing is not voluntary. It is a state of being. I suspect that for many of us, hearing that we are witnesses is not necessarily good news. Witnessing is a loaded word in religious contexts. At one point in my Christian journey, to go witnessing meant to hit the streets with Christian literature to distribute to people walking by and being willing to share the story of the gospel with them. I think I was soured on the idea of witnessing because of one particular experience of my childhood. One year, I must have been fifth or sixth grade, I was invited to a vacation Bible school program at a friend's church. After some very scary preaching early in the week about where I would end up if I didn't take Jesus into my heart, Friday marked the culmination of the program. With our teachers, we went out in the neighborhood with flyers and knocked on doors to pass them out. For the longest time after that, I believed that I wasn't a good Christian if I weren't accosting strangers to ask them about their relationship with Jesus. In case you were wondering, we end our vacation Bible school with a picnic. (laughs) I thought that being a witness meant that I had to know the Bible backwards and forward, that I had to know all the answers to all the questions that someone might possibly ask me, To be sure, grappling with the Bible is an essential part of our Christian journey of faith, but what Jesus was asking was something so much different. The Bible wasn't even a thing yet. Today's reading described the disciples like this, yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. Those disciples sound a little bit like us, don't they? Joyous, but... Now what? One of the problems we have when we think about what it means to discuss our faith, to witness about our faith, is that we think we need to have it all together. It's like people who tell me they can't join a Bible study because they don't know much about the Bible. (laughs) That's what a Bible study is for. We think that we have to have a nice prepared presentation, that it should be filled with Bible quotes, that we should not have any questions ourselves before we're ready to tell someone else about our faith. None of that is true. When Jesus says, you are witnesses of these things, and when he encourages their continuing witness, what they are witnessing to, what they are sharing, is their own stories. Stories of joy and disbelief and wonder Stories of a Jesus who is present in their lives, opening their minds, bringing a bit of peace. Witness is different for every person because our experience of Jesus is different. That's what we are invited to share with others. Our experience of God in Jesus, a Jesus who brings some peace, some joy, who opens our minds, causes us to wonder. And we can share our own grappling, our disbelief and doubt along the way. I am not able to explain everything about my faith because so much of it is a mystery to me. Now, sure, I can read scholars and very smart people. I can parrot their philosophy of language, their biblical hermeneutics based on historical critical analysis, their existential philosophy, their psychoanalytic psychology, and their process theology. But that is not what 99.99% of the people are interested in hearing. 
What most people want to know is whether a relationship with Jesus, whether the Christian journey of faith, where being part of a Christian community, a church, makes any difference for you. Is there really some joy and peace to be found along the way? Is being a part of a community of faith where people pray for you important to you? Is faith, hope, and love really central in your life? I think every person here, every person online has a story about these things, and I know the answers to those questions. Yes, yes, yes. Ultimately, the question is, what is your personal experience with the risen Christ? Some have had lightning bolt experiences. Some have had gentle tugs in this direction or that. Some may feel like you're waiting for that personal experience. All of those answers are okay. Sometimes, oftentimes, experiencing the risen Christ happens when we least expect it. And many times, we look past it or take it for granted. I understand that how we witness a risen Christ is as unique as we are different. The disciples hiding behind locked doors on Easter afternoon and a week later did not all go about their witnessing in the same way. In fact, as I've grown in my faith, I've come to believe and understand that being a witness to the risen Christ very rarely involves words, hardly ever involves words, but always involves actions. I've come to understand that being a witness to the risen Christ means living out your life so that others suspect just by watching that you love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul and that you love your neighbor as yourself. Put another way, you must live your life in such a way that others look at you and see God's grace and love at work in you. Your purpose in life and everything you do is to remember Christ's call to the disciples and to you. You are witnesses. You are the ones who tell the story of Christ's grace and love. It's true in the way you raise your kids, the way you love your family. It's true in the way you work, the way you volunteer, how you treat your neighbors. It's true in how you use your talents. It's true in how you spend your money, how you share your resources. That's true in every choice you make. It means that in this world that so often feels like Good Friday, I'm supposed to be witnessing to Easter with my life. I'm supposed to witness that the destruction and hate and fear of the world do not win, and that God has created a new life where there was no hope and grace where there was none. That's my calling, and it's yours, because that's the calling. That's the job of every Christian. It's having your lip service match your life service. Being a witness means that it becomes your identity, an identifier of who you are and whose you are. To pick up on a famous quote by Maya Angelou, I would add, When people tell you who they are, wait and watch, but when people show you who they are, believe them. I'm reporting live from Geist Christian Church, where a body of believers are gathered together. They gather each week around a table to remember Christ, to sing praises, to hear a word of teaching. These acts that they call worship seem to inspire them so that they can go into the world and witness a risen Christ in the way that they live their very lives. And that's the way it is. April 14th, 2024.
Like many of us, I gathered outside on Monday afternoon to watch the moon pass over the sun. I was very excited leading up to the eclipse, but I have to be honest, I was a bit puzzled about all the fuss. <laughs> like, so many people were traveling from such a far distance to see this, that our cities were uh, concerned about chaos and emergencies. It, it just seemed to be quite an uproar for something that supposedly happens three times a year. Hmm. And then I saw it. Sometimes you just have to see it to experience it. And now I'm planning my trip to Iceland in 2026 <laughs> for the total, total eclipse there. There's something powerful in a witness to experience something that is a once-in-a-lifetime event. And so we come here each and every week to experience Jesus Christ in this meal, this once-in-a-lifetime meal. Jesus appears to us differently today than he did to those disciples following his resurrection, but the resurrected Christ still meets us here today. If only we open our eyes and hearts to him. So may we witness God's overflowing love and overwhelming grace here in this meal as we remember together. That night when Jesus gathered with his disciples, his closest friends, and he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Likewise, he took the cup blessing it and pouring it out, saying, this is the cup of my abundant grace, which is given for each and every one of you. Every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you the glory for this absolutely beautiful spring day. We hold the cup and bread of life in our hands as we partake in these elements. We pray that as Christians, we will not think of one another, but of you, Heavenly Father, and your love for each of us. Guide us, let us lead others to find their way to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. The table is set, and all are welcome. Let us eat and drink together. A witness is a wonderful gift and a great offering. And today we have a great opportunity to, to offer witness and to be the hands and feet of Christ, to live out the mission that he gives us to feed the hungry. I encourage you to go out into the Great Hall or those gathering online to check out the link in the, in the comment section to learn more about Bread for the World and to learn about our farm bill, and to contact your uh, representatives and legislators so that we can work together as a community to create change and difference and feed those in our community. As uh, you go from this place, also, if you are interested in giving to Geist Christian Church as we work together to do this work, there are trays in the back of the sanctuary, or you can give online at geistchristian.org. Enjoy for all that has been given and all that will be given. Let us rise in body or in spirit to sing the doxology together.
stand before you with an invitation that if you have not made that profession and that's on your heart this day, I would invite you to come and join me here at the front of the sanctuary in just a moment as we sing a hymn of invitation. By the same token, if you've been visiting with us and, and are ready to unite with this congregation by transfer, I would welcome that as well. And if you have questions and you've, you want to know a little bit more, this is your lucky day because right after this service, we have a little lunch and learn about Geist Christian Church uh, that will uh, answer some questions for you. So if any of those are the case, if you want to come to the lunch and learn, just see me right after worship. Otherwise, I would invite those uh, to come as we sing our hymn of invitation, number 562, Because He Lives. Let's sing together.
It will remain standing for just a moment. It is good to continue the professions of faith with our 16 pastors class students that began last week. Uh, we had two at the 9 o'clock service this morning, also at the Promise Road campus at this hour. It is a delight to walk with these students. You first, man. Tristan Burfield, I ask you, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and do you profess Him as Lord and Savior of your life? Yes, I do. God bless you in that affirmation. Nora Rode, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and do you profess Him as Lord and Savior of your life? Yes, I do. God bless you. Lily Blaylock. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and do you profess him as Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. God bless you. Let's welcome these and others joining this day uh, with this. We welcome you to Geist Christian Church. We are united in our profession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, our personal Savior. You now join us in our ministry to each other, to this community, and to all people around the world. I'm going to have your sponsoring elders escort you out into the Great Hall where folks can greet you. Go ahead, Roger, read, lead, the, lead the parade. So that part about being a witness, not even a please would you be a witness, not a please would you be a witness if you have time, go, be a witness, amen. Amen. 